Hi World History, it's Mr. Walker and it's Friday today and you're doing a quiz about vocabulary. And I made it a really easy uh, multiple choice quiz and, and you'll see that, but the purpose of it, I want you to feel confident about knowing what these words are. You're gonna use, um, how many did I say? I think four of these words in order to write a response about um, the competition between the USA and the USSR with, uh, there are two competitions that we're looking at. One is the nuclear arms race and the other is the space race and they're tied together and they evolve over time from um, 1945 at the end of World War II um, all the way pretty much to the present. Even though the USSR is no longer around, we are still competitive in an adversary with Russia and they're trying to get that former glory that they used to have. Anyway, let's go through these words and, uh, and then I'll help you uh, write a, a short response that would use vocab words along with evidence and reasoning. All right, I miss you guys. And as you can tell, I, I miss my barber too. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Actually, I sort of love it. Anyway, um, here we go. So uh, this first one, the art or practice of pursuing a dangerous policy to the limits of safety before stopping, typically in politics, and I put the the Spanish translation too. Right here, that's JFK, John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States um, from 1960 to 1963. And that's um, Khrushchev. If I had my Russian dolls, I'd show you him. He came after Stalin. He de-Stalinized Russia. He was uh, much less, he wanted to get rid of the total, some of the totalitarian aspect of society. Anyway, these guys are riding on nuclear weapons and they're going right to the edge, right to the brink. Um, and so this is called brinksmanship. They have a dangerous policy with nuclear weapons and they're going right to the edge. Um, it's like a game of chicken. And who swerves first? Um, and if you don't and you all run into each other, then it can result in nuclear war. Hey, here you go. A second generation nuclear weapon design using a secondary nuclear fusion stage. Um, and so this, uh, right here, um, the first nuclear bomb was a fission bomb, that means it splits. Uh, this is from the hydrogen bomb where it fuses and comes together and releases even more energy. And um, this is known as thermonuclear, okay? This is a, a thermonuclear warhead. Here we go. Um, this is the artificial Soviet uh, satellite. So it says artificial satellite. A natural satellite is the moon. It's something that goes around the earth. An artificial satellite are the ones that are in outer space and help us with our GPS and you know TV signals, things like that. This is the very first satellite, Sputnik, in 1957. And the first people to launch it into space were the Russians, uh, were the Soviets. And so this is, this is Sputnik. And you could actually see it. Um, People were looking up in the night sky over the U.S., looking up, and they could see it blinking. Um, like a, When you see a satellite in the sky, it looks like a little star going across the sky. And people looked up at it, and they thought, oh, my gosh, if the Soviets can launch the satellite going over the um, United States, what else could they, could they launch? Could they spy on us? Could they bomb us all the way away? And, and those fears end up you know, later becoming correct. Can they spy on us? And so... Um, that was the first satellite and there was a lot of um, apprehension and fear in the United States because of it. This has to do with related to projectiles or their flight. Uh, Napoleon was a master at it. You can see even uh, way back, uh, they're looking at these parabolas, whether it's Leonardo da Vinci or this military handbook from 1613 about shooting your arrow at a specific angle in order to hit somebody. Remember, Napoleon was amazing at, at mathematics and that helped his uh, genius with artillery too. And this is the science of ballistics. Um, so ballistic. And later you'll you'll see these these are called ballistic missiles. These thermonuclear warheads. Um, during the policy of brinksmanship, they would use thermonuclear warheads and um, be able to launch them into space. Uh, and they're called intercontinental ballistic missiles. And both the United States and the USSR had a large accumulation of these. Um, of these bombs and these weapons. Uh, it's called a stockpile. I think I've already used four of them. You could already write your, 
your essay a little bit of the stockpiles of nuclear weapons that both the USA and USSR or Russia still have. We have the most, uh, the largest stockpile in the world by far. Um, and this is the Spanish is intercontinental. I wonder what the answer is. It's intercontinental, meaning that these are such powerful missiles, they can travel from one continent to another, that there is nowhere in the world that you are safe um, anymore from the reach of military technology. And so because the world became so dangerous with a push of a button, you could destroy the other side. And while that those nukes were in the air, those missiles, the other side could launch a retaliation strike. Um, and so because we were so worried about that, we had to have something called diplomacy. Instead of fighting, fighting was no longer an option, at least a direct confrontation. And so diplomacy or the act of uh, of having relations, international relations, and speaking or talking to each other with representatives. Uh, that's why the United Nations has been so important. It has been a place to resolve conflict um, and put differences in the open uh, rather than paranoia and people just acting out of fear, as we saw with the start of World War I, where it was like a doomsday clock. Um, diplomacy in the United Nations continue to be incredibly important because we have weapons that can destroy the whole world. Uh, this is John Foster Dulles, um, and uh, he was, uh, right after World War II, he was President Eisenhower's Secretary of State, and this is his quote, you have to take chances for peace just as you take chances in war. We walked to the brink and we looked it in the face, and so he said he was willing to almost go to war in order to get peace, and if that sounds... Um, sort of crazy and ridiculous, it, it was a little bit. Uh, and you'll see some of his policies that he had, especially in Latin America, uh, had horrible human um, consequences. Okay, uh, this here is, yeah, fusion. Remember, instead of fission, which splits an atom, fusion is when atoms come together to form a new, um, uh, a new, uh, what would you call this? This is chemistry, This <laughs> to form a new compound, and, uh, and it releases a huge amount of energy. And this is f fusion, and nuclear fusion is how the, um, how the, uh, the H-bomb, the hydrogen bomb worked. Okay, this is a spy plane from the United States. Um, we usually fly at about 30,000 feet when you're in a commercial airliner, but if you were in one of these, you'd fly at over 70,000 feet. It was very lightweight, and it held a camera in the bottom. And I had the, uh, um, uh, the film, uh, what's it called? Uh, I, I gave you that preview to watch with Tom Hanks in it uh, about the shooting down of of the U-2 spy plane in 1960 and the pilot, Gary Powers, who was taught actually to kill himself rather than be captured, was unable to do that um, and, uh, and was captured by the Russians and shown on TV. Uh, you know, similarly to like Gavrilo Princip, you know, trying to commit suicide after the assassination. This is uh, the pilot of the spy plane, Gary Powers, was shot down over Soviet territory and, um, and was captured. And so this is called the U-2, the U-2 plane. Um, that's it. Uh, this is uh, uh, retaliate. So the idea with nuclear weapons, right? It takes, um, I think it's, I, I don't know the exact amount of time, but it was something close to 20 minutes between the launch of a nuclear weapon from uh, the United States to reach Russia or the opposite. Um, now with these new hypersonic missiles, it would happen much quicker, but with the launch of a regular um intercontinental ballistic missile, the idea was you would see it launched and then you would retaliate fully in order to destroy the other side too. And so that was um, how people were, uh, that was our foreign policy. So during that time, you have the development of, of nuclear weapons, of bigger ones that can be carried on missiles. We also had the development uh, of NASA and, and JPL, which is in uh, Pasadena, just right next to us, uh, of space programs <clears throat> and of exploration. And they were tied to the, you know, if it weren't for developing rockets and going to outer space, we wouldn't have been able to develop those intercontinental ballistic missiles. But we also use it for science and for discovery. And, um, and this was, these are called Mariners, the Mariner program, uh, almost like discovery, think of like Columbus. That's why they're naming them like 
after ships. Um, it's the modern version of, of ex exploration into the unknown. Okay, an intercontinental ballistic missile, and this is just the acronym for it, ICBMs, okay? Intercontinental ballistic missile. And uh, ballistic is one of the uh, one of the terms too. Okay, here we go. This right here, if you explore or probe the moon, uh, this is called a lunar probe. Okay, right here, uh, the explosive tet. That's the French word for head. This is a warhead. All right, that's at the top, the tip of the missile that delivers its payload. Right here. Um, if you show someone in somewhere, it marks the start of something new. This is ushered. Um, the bomb, or here, Marco El Comienzo. Uh, this is the, the bomb at Hiroshima. This ushered in the nuclear era. Um, this is, has to do with secret code or encoding. This idea is called a cipher or ciphering. We saw that with the Enigma machine and with the computer. There's lots of spy craft during this time of military and industrial secrets. And so this next part, there was so much tension that went on um, where we came so close to nuclear war, especially in the 19, early 1960s uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'll learn about that later. But um, there had to be a period where tensions were resolved or at least lessened a bit. And this period was known as detente, and it happened in the 70s. You see this bear, right? Russia and the USA. Um, instead of fighting each other, we, agree, we made agreements uh, because we were worried about destroying the entire world and each other with our nuclear weapons. And you see their little baby, the dove, the representation of peace. And so this is a, um, it was known as detente or a lessening of tensions. And there were agreements, the SALT, uh, treaty, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. And there's President Jimmy Carter. He was the president when I was born uh, in 1978. And, uh, and there's Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, he, was, uh, he was actually a really um, hard-nosed, more totalitarian than the last one, Khrushchev. He's closer to Stalin. But he had this weird habit of, uh, of kissing instead of shaking hands. And I always think of the Brezhnev kiss uh, and President Carter's thinking, if I shake hands with Brezhnev, uh-oh, he goes right in for a big smacker. And so, uh, <laughs> well, better to, you know, kiss your enemy than to be, uh, um, than to launch a nuclear weapon. Although kissing Brezhnev does not look like, like fun. Okay. Um, this is, relates to something called uh, paridad, uh, parity. There it is, parity, meaning equality if two sides are evenly matched up against each other. And the USA and USSR had parity with their nuclear weapons. Um, uh, you know, just like if, you know, you were to have, uh, you know, two really good basketball teams going against each other. It's fun to watch parity in sports. Although when it comes to two superpowers, um, it's scary because they each try to get an advantage. Um, right here, a state of great disturbance, confusion, or uncertainty. Uh, that would be turmoil. And a lot of the war creates turmoil here. Um, this is a cartoon that um, talks about how when we bomb a place like uh, outside of the United States borders, um, there's turmoil there, but it also leads to turmoil in our own country because you have all of these people trying to escape the war zone and then coming um, coming to our country. In this case, it's when there's wars in the Middle East, people flee to Europe. Uh, we'll also see later when there are wars in El Salvador or Mexico, and a lot of them are related to the United States um, foreign policy, people f flee to the United States. And this is saying, well, you have the courage to bomb other countries. Do you have the courage to take on the responsibilities of people who uh, are seeking shelter in your own country? Uh, and finally, um, this is... Uh, known as realpolitik. And this is the idea of, uh, Kissinger puts it well, America has no permanent friends, only enemies, or enemies, only interests. They say, we're not gonna make decisions for any moral reason, for good or bad, just for, um, uh, for what we're gonna get in the moment. Uh, and so this is uh, a type of politics that's pretty scary, of people who don't have, um, don't have allegiances or values, but just do something to get an advantage. 
Um, this quote is the ends justify the means. It's worth doing anything to get what you want. Or it's, uh, and so that's, uh, that's this idea of realpolitik. Okay, so finally, use four vocab words, respond to the following prompt with claim, evidence, and reasoning. Explain the conditions that made war more likely during the Cold War, and also explain what occurred to make war less likely. Okay, so what happened to make war more likely was the creation of nuclear weapons on both sides, okay? And so I'm gonna make a claim. War was more likely due to the creation of, and instead of saying nuclear weapons, I'm gonna use one of our vocab words. I'm gonna use ICBMs, and then I'm also gonna use another vocab word, intercontinental, ballistic, that's another vocab word, intercontinental, one, two, three, missiles, That's his war. Sorry, I'm used to writing in, in caps for you on the board, and when I write for myself, I, I don't as well. War was more likely due to the creation of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and I'm gonna also say in a policy, oh, you know what, instead of, sorry, I'm editing as I go. As I read my own writing, I think, could I have written this better or could I put a vocab word? I, I can here. So right here, I'm going to go, war was more likely due to the creation, I'm going to write, and stockpiles. They collected a lot of nuclear weapons due to the creation and stockpiles of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and a policy of brinksmanship. That means going to the edge, right? Almost going to war until someone else backs down. Um, so that's how war was made more likely. War was made more likely. There's my claim. And I use my reasoning um, in here too, along with my vocab. But I also need to answer the question, how is it made less likely too? But war was later made less likely. You know what, I should put a date. Policy of brinksmanship in the 1960s. I want you to notice how I write. Is Are my ideas fully formed coming out of my head writing like beautiful sentences? No, um, I start and as you write, it's a process of editing and thinking and so I'm, that's pretty much what I'm doing here as, I, um, as we're doing this together. Uh, and I don't want to be prepared to show you because writing is messy, learning is messy, it's a bit of a struggle and you keep going over it and figuring it out. And so if you're doing that, that means you're a good writer, okay? So um, I don't want you to think that you'll just be able to boom, pop out beautiful sentences. It's a, it's a process. So give yourself, um, give yourself the... Uh, the permission to, to be ugly with your writing because it's an ugly process, but later turns out to look good. It's like, you know, if you're working out, you have to sweat. You have to make your ugly face, just like when you're writing, okay? And in order to make it, um, to make it worthwhile. Okay, but war was later made less likely, and this was because of the policy of detente, because of the... Policy of detente, which lessened tensions and put limitations. And so we have these treaties with the USSR, with Russia, about the limits of our nuclear weapons that we can have. Frighteningly enough, um, Trump has pulled out of our of our um, our treaties with Russia and Putin has also, and so it's um, it's pretty scary. We're we're sort of entering a new phase of uh, of the nuclear arms race right now, and you guys read it read about it in the quiz you took earlier, and so that's something um, along with a global pandemic that we should be worried about our uh, 
the state of our of the nuclear weapons in the world. Okay, um, always making things a bummer in history class. But war was later made less likely because of the policy of detente, which lessened tensions and put um, limitations on nuclear weapons. Or I'm gonna use the word warheads because it's another vocab word. Warheads with the SALT agreements. Agreements uh, between Carter, uh, President Carter, and Soviet Premier. Premier is the word they use for leader. Uh, Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev. Oh my gosh. Okay. Woo. That's my response. Uh, I need to put a date in here. Brezhnev by the late 1970s. The tensions then go up after the 70s in the 80s with Reagan. We're going to learn about the Star Wars program and how that caused more uh, tensions. Um, but anyway, let me look it over. And notice when you do use um, specific vocab that is related to the topic, it really makes your writing increase uh, in its, um, it, it makes your writing better. And so, uh, okay, let's just look at the response and then I'll stop. War was most was more likely due to the creation and stockpiles of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and a policy of brinksmanship in the 1960s. But war, oh, you know what, I should say, but war, war between the USA and USSR. I want to be specific here. Between the USA and USSR. So see what I'm doing here? As I'm writing, I'm going over it and I'm clarifying. I'm making sure that my writing is clear. War between the USA and USSR was more likely due to the creation and stockpiles of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and a policy of brinksmanship in the 1960s. But, I need to put a comma. Whenever you use the word but or however, it's gonna make your writing more complex because you're uh, speaking about um, uh, complexity that sometimes, um, if you find yourself saying always something is this, there are always exceptions. And so showing an exception or a change over time is going to demonstrate complexity. And the world is complex. And so your writing should also be complex. Uh, not um, So it can be simple in the way that you write, but complex in its ideas. Don't think that complexity means you need to use big words or make your sentences grand. Um, but complexity means your ideas are, are, are complex. And so can show a difference or a change. Um, and so this word but is always good when I'm looking at people's writing and their analysis. But war was later made less likely because of the policy of detente, which lessened tensions and put limitations on nuclear warheads with the SALT agreements between President Carter and Soviet Premier Brezhnev by the late 1970s. Woo, okay, that's, a, that's something I, I'm pretty satisfied with. And then I'm gonna write my long answer text in there. And of course you don't have to write that, but if that sends you along a path of understanding and writing a better response, go ahead and use it. Or don't surprise me with, uh, with how you are going to make your response. All right, guys, I miss you so much and, uh, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.